So, welcome back. We're in the final stages of the FIPP World Congress. Uh, congratulations uh, uh, if you're still here in our track. Uh, we'll be joined very soon by those from the specialist tra uh, stage as we move towards the end uh, of this event. However, our next session is particularly powerful for all of us. We spend a lot of time talking about revenue, about audience building, about cooperation and collaboration with the major platforms. Um, we've talked about data, AI, all of those topics. But at heart, what all of us are as media-owning brands is storytellers. And the next panel will discuss precisely that. Uh, fortunately, my task is simply to introduce uh, the moderator for that panel. Please welcome the Chief Executive of PPA here in the UK, Barry McElhenney. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, just before we begin and before I introduce the panel, uh, I just wanted to say one thing, which is uh, myself and Mark Frith, who's on the panel, would actually be at a funeral uh, right now if we weren't here, and that's the funeral of a gentleman called Richard Lowe, who I'm sure some of you know. Richard succeeded me as the editor of Smash Hits, so I hired Richard, uh, and Richard in turn hired Mark. Uh, so he's really the missing link today uh, in terms of not being with us. Um, the funeral's taking place as we speak, and I did say to his wife, Naomi, that I would uh, mention Richard uh, and have him in our thoughts as we do this panel today. So uh, thank you very much, and our thoughts and prayers are with Naomi and her family. So um, kicking into the panel, uh, I'm delighted to say uh, we have a gentleman who I sat on a panel with two years ago in Toronto, Olivier Royon. Is that good pronunciation, Olivier? Is that okay? Uh, Editor-in-chief of Paris Match. Uh, next to Olivier, we have Mr. Mark Frith, the Editorial Director of Radio Times. Uh, and next to him, we have uh, Gina Johnson, the Editorial Director of Motivate Publishing from the United Arab Emirates. So I'm going to make my way to sit here now uh, and ask each of them to talk for a minute or two about themselves and their brands in very general terms. History of the brands, how many copies they sell, what frequency they are, just so we're all familiar. Uh, we're going to make this a really interactive session, okay? We've been sitting around for a day and a half. I've got a microphone here. It may not look like a microphone. And I'm going to be throwing it to the first people who put their hands up. So let's get some questions ready. But firstly, Olivier, over to you. Thank you, Barry. So my name is Olivier Royon. I am a, I'm a happy editor of uh, Paris Match, the French news magazine. The magazine was created in 1949 after the war in France. Probably the French people tried to do uh, what Time magazine and Life magazine were doing in the US. Uh, we are still in business 70 years later. The last issue of Paris Match was sold as 750,000 copies in France and around the world. Uh, we a week? A week, a weekly magazine. Uh, we still have uh, the, the opportunity in France to have a, a network of 25,000 retailers, people who sell the magazine every week in every single city in France. So we are lucky to have this, uh, this network like the German have. And on the other side, we have been exploring new areas over the last, uh, I would say, five, 10 years. Uh, new, new business, new opportunities to, to make our brand, uh, to introduce our brand to new audiences. And I would, maybe we'll talk about the, the, uh, our last uh, experience, enterprise, which was uh, the, the work we did with uh, Snapchat on the Discover platform, which is probably one of the, we are dealing with a younger audience, 15 to 24. And uh, between this, uh, Snapchat, uh, this Snapchat work and our weekly edition on the print, these are the two extremes of our business We today, shall definitely probably. come to that. How long have you been with the title? I can escape the business. I, 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 I arrived at Paris Match when I was a kid, 21, 22. I'm still there, 33 years later. So, wow. uh, and I've been the US and the White House correspondent for 10 years. So uh, I had the time to, to discover other so, things in France. 33 years. I think I'm right, Mark, for three weeks? <laughs> yeah, three or four weeks. <laughs> three or four so, weeks. Mark, tell us about Radio Times. OK, so Radio Times is uh, a British institution, not just in the world of publishing, but as an entity. Um, if you go into anyone's house, particularly at Christmas time, you'll see a copy of Radio Times folded over on that day um, on the arm of a sofa. So essentially, its, it's history is it started uh, 94 years ago as, as you can tell from the title, uh, a magazine that told you when radio shows were on. And then as TV developed, it uh, began printing the times of TV shows, but only for the BBC. 
up until 92, we had this crazy rule in the UK where uh, only Radio Times could run listings for the BBC, only TV Times could run listings for ITV. And it stayed like that uh, for a very long time, too long, until about 25 years ago. And now we run listings for everything, and of course that is growing all the time. How many copies are you selling? We're selling about 700,000 a week. It's a huge phenomenon, uh, way more of the Christmas double issue. And um, TV is growing. You know, there's many different ways of watching TV on many different platforms. And as the TV listings world becomes more confusing, it's our job to make it kind of simpler for people. Okay. But we're not just a magazine. We are a very successful and growing website. We are also events as well. We have the very successful Radio Times Festival every year in conjunction with the BFI. Well, how's it going after three weeks? I'm loving every second of it, yeah. Great okay. colleagues many of whom are here. And, uh, <laughs> okay, says, and uh, says here. Gina, tell us about Motivate in the UAE. So Motivate Media Group is the, uh, the first magazine publisher in the United Arab Emirates. It's been around for about more than 35 years. We have about 20 print titles, um, which are made up of proprietary titles, some licensed editions, and a pretty robust contract publishing division. Um, and we have some proprietary websites as well. Uh, and we also have, um, our, our business is quite diversified. We have a large books publishing department. We publish over 200 books. Um, and we have a, a successful cinema advertising business and also an events business. So um, for a traditional publisher, we have, we've, we've diversified a little bit in the last couple of years. Um, and we're finding that those, um, those other non-traditional publishing entities or units of the business are actually um, doing very well for us. So we've heard a lot in the last two days about uh, advertising and platforms, and programmatic and native, etc. This is a chance really to, to hear from three of the expert storytellers at the absolute heart of the business, the people creating this world-class content. I'm going to start with you, Olivier. Um, you've been there a long time. What, what's, what's the biggest single change uh, in the role of the editor over the last few years? I would uh, use a food image, like... Uh, over the last, during 50 or 60 years, Paris Match has been concentrating or preparing each week the big paella, this uh, Spanish paella? food. And suddenly we ended up, over the last three or four years, in having to feed the, the readers with tapas all day long. And this is a real diff a diff a different business. And you have, we have to, as an editor, we have to, to, to work on different platforms. And at some point, years ago, we believed that we could have one content and we would distribute the content on each platform. This is not true. We have to tailor a content for each different platform. I was using the, I was talking about Discover. Uh, we, we can talk also about Facebook, about, about videos, about radio, podcast. Is the paella still at the heart of it? Yes, the paella will exist. It still exists on the, on, on the Thursday morning, but we were talking about this, but this 24 hours news cycles is a reality. I mean, what you, if you take the example of what had the shooting in Las Vegas last week, big stories, the, the Barcelona over the last two weeks. I mean, these are major stories that you have to cover also, almost on a minute basis, which is we used to have uh, people, we, the, the prime of the editors today is that they are dealing with a lifestyle issue. For example, the timing of the story becomes a key. You don't, you don't have the same story at 7 o'clock in the morning, and sometimes at noon you will put some videos and then go back to more traditional stories at 5 o'clock. So the editor has to keep in mind this, the timing of the, of the story, and also he has to, we, we have to refresh the stories at a time. And at the same time, as a magazine, as a weekly magazine, we have to concentrate on our print edition, because the print edition is a beauty and we still want to be in business in years from now. Mark, are you still doing paella or are you doing tapas even in this Brexit, <laughs> Brexit world that we're in? But you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of the symbol for me that I remember uh, my early editorship at Smash Hits by was the flat plan, the physical flat plan. And it would it'd be the thing when it, you, one would go and uh, turn it, uh, tinker with the flat plan. That's what you would do. Editors would spend their days tinkering with the flat plan. It was a physical thing, big A3 sheet of paper. If you wanted to move something, you'd do a circle around it and an arrow, and then it'd go somewhere else, and you'd take it along to the production editor, and they would print out a new version, and then you'd go off and tinker some more. And that, for me, was the symbol of my life as an editor in those early days. And then thinking about it, the symbol of my, my life as an editor now is, is an app that sits on my phone called Chartbeat that just tells me in, in live real time 
uh, what pages are being accessed on our website. And it moves around, and you can see what's growing, and you can see whether a new story you've just put on works or whether it doesn't. And that kind of just shows you, it goes from this incredible kind of system where things move around quite slowly, you know, at timing where I've just left, there were, you know, there was no physical flat plan, there was nothing to tinker with, it all sat on your screen. And so it kind of just shows you that this kind of thing that you can access 24 hours a day, that people can access 24 hours a day, is now the symbol for me of being an editor and is my route into the editing that I want to do and what I want to do with content. So that, that kind of shows you, for me, how much it's changed. And for many editors, actually, I don't think that's an untypical kind and of And does the UAE, does this sound familiar or is it totally different? It's familiar. I would say that it's, it's probably even... Uh, it's, a, it's probably even more important in our market where our, our business model is based on advertising revenue, where the editor is... It's a very important facet of being an editor as being um, a brand ambassador. And I would say the two most in, important criteria for an editor in, in my market um, are being an ideas generator and being a collaborator. So uh, how that has changed over the last couple of decades is that once what was required of an editor was to be a judicious journalist, and, and that is still the case, that's, that's still important, but I think that a contemporary editor um, today has to be so many other things as well. Well, Olivia, you said to me earlier when we were talking that an editor has to be a general, which sounded a bit militaristic, is that, is that what you meant? A general... Uh... Lead, leading the pack, leading the pack like the general at war, uh, in, in, uh, leading the, the battalion. I think it's our, uh, our sheriff patrolling the street. I will take an example, for example, when a big breaking news happened. Uh, what would the editor do these days? I think he would, he would say it would be the central nerve of the, of the operation, and he will have to, to, give, to get the overview of the operation. For example, reporter number one, number two, you're going to feed the story with Twitter. Reporter number three, number four, you're going to go back to a more traditional approach of, uh, of the story. We're going to call your sources, call the police. You're going to write a, a longer stories. Reporter number five, you're going, to, you're going to be the one who write the big pile for the next edition, which means you're going to, you're going to get all of the feed from the, from the Twitter, everything. And maybe number six, number seven, you're going to know the commentary. So we are, we, we, this is a group. I mean, this person cannot work alone, but he has to be the one who gives the, who give the, uh, the uh, I would say the, the movement. He has to know this editor, she or he, has to understand each platform, the language of each platform, and also he has to understand the temporality of each platform. Do you have to see everything? Do you still see everything? I uh, don't see everything. I used to see everything when we only have a print edition, like it was 15 years ago. These days, I, I must say that I, I don't see everything on the, on the Twitter feed. On the Twitter feed, yes, but on, the, on our website, no. And how many staff do you have? But I would say that the, the, in the perfect world, you will have one editor leading one story. We, we would assign one editor to be the one around, with a group around him or, he, or she uh, to, to, to run a story. It doesn't have to be me. It can be somebody else within the, within, within the newsroom. How many people in your team? 100. Mark, how many? 60. On the, on the, on the, the editorial side of Radio uh, Times. I know you people. used to like to see everything. Do you still see everything? Yeah, I do, actually. I do, actually no, I don't see all the listings. We have a listings editor who takes care of that. If, I wouldn't get home if I saw every kind of word in, in terms of the listings. But you know, t talking about there, the kind of main roles of uh, the editor and everything, for me, it's preserving the kind of brand values of what we do. So um, there are a lot of TV listings magazines out there, but there's nothing like Radio Times. Radio St Times stands for quality uh, journalism, for leading the PR agenda, for being fronted by experts, and is of kind of a unique, and as we say earlier, iconic magazine in that way. So I see my role, no matter what, we are doing, no matter whether it's an event or it's a web story or it's the new edition of the magazine, of making sure that we're always seen in that kind of premium way. The quality, legendary magazine that is Radio Times needs to be infused through every iteration of what we do. And that, when it comes down to it, probably is my number one role. And of course, 20 years ago, we weren't talking about magazines in terms of brands. We were just talking about in terms of magazines. But maintaining those brand values, yeah. making sure it goes through everything, is probably my number one role. How many people do you have, Gina, at Motivate? Well, th th this is an interesting thing because um, obviously Mark and Olivia are working on very big, big brands. Yeah. I have less 
team members across 20 magazines than they have on each of their individual magazines. So we have a team of about uh, 60 at the moment. Um, I would call them editorial staff. They range from editors to journalists, a sub-editor, uh, art directors, designers across 20 magazines. So we have to be very agile and lean in terms of the skill set that you bring to the job. So even as an editor, you will be required to edit your magazine, but you, you, you've you also have to be very adept at moving between um, different requirements of the job. Do we have questions from the floor? We've got this microphone, which I'm going to throw. Uh, we've got three top editors here. There's one. Could you say... Wow. <laughs> Could you say who you are uh, and a question, please? Yes. Um, I'm Kali from the India Today group, uh, and my question is to Olivier. Um, I want to know if the chefs who make the piala and who make the tapas are the same, and whether you recycle some of the tapas into piala for the week, no, it's a, or it's is a, it completely separate? It's a, it's a, you're absolutely right. It's a key, it's a key element, key question. Uh, the chef has. As uh, Mark was saying, cannot be the same I'm on, on a 24 hours uh, news cycle. I mean, it has, to, it has to change. I'm not in Paris today, so there's somebody else doing my job right now in, in Paris. Uh, I would say that uh, the, 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 the writing is very different. I mean, when you're dealing with print, we used to deal with brain and eyes. When you deal with mobile device, you have to deal with brain, eyes, and the finger. People, I mean, the, our readers, they want to play with the fingers and they want to tap and something has to happen on the, on the, uh, on, on the screen. So this, uh, this, one of our main challenges today is this uh, uh, visual storytelling and, and uh, linear visual storytelling, which we need to communicate the way people, and as, a, as a journalist, we need to communicate as the way people communicate on WhatsApp and when they ex ex exchange uh, text messages. So, you tap, you, I write, I show. Uh, and that requires young talents, that requires new people. And what are our, one of our challenges these days in our brand, this old brand, 70 year old, I mean, we need to bring the digital mentality within our brand. And that's what we start to do with the extreme project like Discover, because Discover, you tap and suddenly uh, Beyonce starts singing, or you tap and uh, you have, uh, uh, red uh, hearts flying over the screens. I mean, this was not what we, what we do in Mosul or in, uh, we, or, or in uh, Miami. Uh, so these people, they brought to us the digital mentality and they, in terms of storytelling, I mean, what we have to do is to be creative. I mean, what the, the beauty of the magazine is to explore new trends. We have to remain, uh, we have to remain creative because that's why people go to our brands and because we are creative. Visually, we have to be creative and, of course, uh, one of the, the challenges for us, every single editor of these days should have around him people who, who don't remember life without Google. I mean, this, is, this mentor mentee relationship is very important because this is the way for our, for our uh, news outlets to, to rejuvenate and, uh, and to address the, the new, these new times. Gina, you, meant, you were talking earlier about um, the storytelling that we do for brands, mm. which you do a lot through contract publishing and. and and we had a conversation about this earlier in the event. I mean, can brands, can brands just not tell their own story? Can Procter & Gamble not just tell the Procter & Gamble story? Or well, what, what, what is it about us that makes us do that differently or better? I, I actually think it's one of the greatest opportunities for publishers to claw out of new revenue streams. What would otherwise be traditional spend on advertising, creative agencies, PR um, budgets, marketing budgets. Um, because what we're seeing is a convergence of all of these um, traditional media companies. And for publishers, because we are um, at the heart of what we do is, is exceptional storytelling, it, it's a great opportunity for us. And um, some case studies for us are that we're actually seeing that come to fruition. So we've done, we, we've been, we're very involved in branded content in our market, especially because it's an advertising-driven revenue model. And there's some, some of our branded content that we've created this year, uh, for instance, in the digital space, there's a piece of branded content that was the most successful piece of content that we created this year to date was a collaboration between our biggest website and a, a niche yachting brand that, that launched in our market. And the way that we positioned that content was um, uh, suggesting that it was the Uber of yacht 
bookings. So not only we, we measure that success by our own traffic, but also within a couple of hours of that content um, going live, it was already they were already um, receiving um, bookings and inquiries. So it, it, they converted sales immediately, and then beyond that other media picked up our story and ran it as authentic content. So I guess that's the holy grail, if you like, of branded content, is that you know that it's just hit the mark, where not only are your audiences responding to it, but other audiences beyond your audiences are, are responding to it as Any well. Any questions for our stellar panel? I think we have one here from Mr. Uh, Ralph Pucci. Yes, thank you, Ralph Pucci, Ringy Axel Springer. Uh, we had a presentation on that topic just uh, an hour ago, uh, on now two hours ago, on native advertising, and uh, the gentleman showed some uh, inquiries and uh, a research that said that 72% uh, of the companies asked how they are producing native stories, native advertising stories, said that it would, have, it would be realized by the core editorial team. And now I would like to get your opinion as editors-in-chief, responsible editors, how you handle that in your companies and if that seems feasible to you, that independent journalists, such as we knew them for decades, now suddenly write commercial articles to them. Mark, do you have any experience with that? Yeah, I do. So, so immediate, uh, kind of media, the company that Radio Times is part of, are, are making kind of real inroads in this. We, we partner with people, but we partner with them because they come to us because we stand for something and our writers stand for something. But it's also something, if it works best, that expands the world of the reader anyway. A really good example of this, so Netflix came to us about a year or so ago because they wanted to build in their subscriber base. They had this new show that was about to come on that there was a lot of hype about called The Crown. And they came to us because they wanted us, our readers to sample the, um, the channel, the, the Netflix, for um, a month for free. We didn't have to give over the credit card details. And that's something that readers are a bit suspicious about, actually. They think if they give over their credit card details, they get tied into something, they can't get out of it. But it worked for everyone. You know, uh, People got to sample Netflix. They liked it. Um, they liked our tone and the way we did things. And we could reach a certain market that um, they couldn't reach in through any other way. Radio Do you make it very clear that it's it. different from editorial? Absolutely. But, 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 but the readers would thank us as well, because we are, be, we are introducing them to something at no risk to themselves. That, that we know is going to be of interest to them. And we have to be the arbiter on that. And we are. And we were very, very careful about that. But that is a prime example for me of working with a brand who wants to be introduced to our readership. And we can do it in a way where it benefits both parties. Really quite, I can't believe we appear to have five minutes left. So can we have any more questions that people have got burning desire to ask? We have one here from, we need to throw the microphone to Mr. Owen Meredith. Uh, if you could give a pass, go on, Owen. Well, hell. Uh, I just wondered, uh, in terms of storytelling, whether you think that long-form journalism uh, has a space and continues, will continue to have a space going forward in a world where people seem to have less and less time. Very much. Okay, the more, the, the more tapas you produce, the more long-term journalism you need. It's very important to, to have this, to the format. The, the, the faster it goes, the... the the, the expectations are on the, on the magazine to, to go in depth and to go inside. And, uh, and, and I think that we, uh, we, we have to focus our resources on one of my main problems today. I don't want to imitate radio station. I don't want to imitate the, the, the nightly news on, uh, on, on television. So how can we position ourselves on original stories? Because that's where the good storytelling in magazine is all about. I mean, trying to find the stories that nobody yet. Uh, I was reading somewhere the, the story of the last days of Che Guevara. I mean, this is some, in, in Bolivia. I mean, somebody went there and spent three or four weeks to find the actors that were which, around Che Guevara at this time. Was, the New York Times did it, and some, some other publication in Germany did it. But that's good. I mean, that's good journalism. So there is no, uh, in, in, uh, the, the, in working with the new platforms and knowing that we are uh, dealing with an accelerated rhythm, we are focusing also on long investigative pieces. And uh, the, these are one way for, for the magazine weekly to, uh, um, uh, even monthly, to, uh, to differentiate themselves. Of course, the good journalism these days, the, good, the, the journalists who get, we find good stories. I mean, the, the stories that you won't read somewhere else. I, I mean, I just, got, I just got sent the Harvey Weinstein story that's in the New Yorker, which the New Yorker clearly had ready to run. And I was sent it on the phone, and it's so long, and I read every single word of it. Yeah, it must have taken over an hour because it's so good. And we, 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 mu we must say in the Harvey Weinstein story, which is a very good story of our times, because you could see the New York Times getting 
the head of the, of the pack, and then you get the New Yorker who was there. And at the same time, people also will go back to your brand, will go back to the New York Times of the, to, to, to 15 times a day to, to know where the story is. And that's, uh, that's uh, I think, the, the, the strength of this magazine, of, this, of the New York Times and the New Yorker that they demonstrated today and yesterday, is, is be, being able to do at the same time both formats. So, final question for each of you. We're doing this throughout the two days. Uh, the biggest challenge, uh, one each, the biggest challenge that lies ahead for storytellers like yourselves in the next few years. What's the, Gina, what's the single biggest challenge that you think we have? I would say that listening to people outside of our industry is important. I think that we, we can be a very introspective industry. We, we like to, to listen to ourselves and tell each other that everything's going to be okay. And I think that sometimes really good ideas um, can come from the most unexpected places. Um, I, th I think that we, um, it doesn't have to be that complex as well. I think that sometimes really simple ideas. If we'd been sitting here three years ago and, and you'd been told that we'd all be listening to our long podcasts of This American Life, I'm pretty sure no one would actually believe you. Yep. But that's a very simple idea that came from sort of outside of publishing. So I would say um, just look outside of the, the, the box, so to speak. Mark? Um, Mark? Maintaining our brand values as we, as we move into many different iterations. Olivier, last word with you after all these years on Paris. The world, the world truth. I mean, uh, last year, the, the boss of Instagram came to Paris and said, I'm in the storytelling business. I say, no, I am in the storytelling business. Uh, <laughs> you, we are dealing with the stories, and we are doing with war. We are doing with the, with the death, with the life of the people. And I think we have to, our brands and the magazines have to maintain this criteria of power. Years ago, you used to be uh, when you, you used to check all your facts because going for the story. Now. You go through the story because the story is already there somewhere. So you have to, to be very careful. I mean, the, the, the main challenge for us is to remain a beacon of truth and fairness and, uh, and journalism. This is the key word, journalism. Thank you very much to Olivier, Mark, and to Gina. Thank you, Barry. And uh, thank you, uh, panel.